Great. Good evening, everyone. I'm Deborah Schoen, and I help coordinate programming here at the Adrian's Memorial Library and the Boardman Road Library. Um, and this is an evening of poetry. We usually meet at the Lehman Loeb Art Museum at Vassar, but because of COVID, we're back here at Adrian's. But the museum is open on Saturday and Sundays uh, to the public. A snowstorm last month canceled Gordon Riggs, and we rescheduled Gordon for May 20th. Next month, February 18th, we will have Cassandra Clark um, as our featured poet, and she will be Zooming in her reading. So I will set that up soon on the Event Keeper, and um, those who sign up will receive a Zoom link to watch her from home because she feels more comfortable with that. So I just ask that we're kind of like flying by the seat of our pants and going with what the poet feels more comfortable doing, um, you know, and, and they don't really know until it becomes more closer to the actual event. So sometimes they feel okay and then all of a sudden it's like I don't want to be in public. So we're just trying to really like um, work with people and, and, and understand everybody's different comfort levels. Um, so next month, again, we'll be Zooming it. It will only be available on Zoom, and we'll be recording it, and then it'll be put up on YouTube for those who can come to the Zoom event. Um, so tonight we have Will Nixon, and I stole this bio from his website, willnixon.com. Uh, Will Nixon grew up in the Connecticut suburbs. He spent his young adulthood in Hoboken in Manhattan and then moved to the Catskills to a log cabin in 1996 complete with the wood stove and mice. For years he wrote environmental journalism then turned to poetry and personal essays. He has been his work has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and listed in Best American Essays 2004. Uh, he now lives in Woodstock, New York um, now complete with a wall thermostat for heat, but he still can't get rid of those mice. So um, thank you for those of you who came out to be here. If you want to help me give Will Nixon a nice warm Poughkeepsie welcome. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone out there in internet land, for being with us. I wish you could be here, but better that you're with us this way than not at all. So I really appreciate this very much. Um, I'm going to read from a book uh, called, called Love in the City of Grudges. Um, I lived in Hoboken, New Jersey, in the 1980 to 1990 or so going through rapid, rabid gentrification, you know, small brick city, a uh, lot of vitality, a lot of arts, uh, a lot of craziness. And um, years later, I started writing about it, and a good friend of mine uh, in Woodstock had actually lived in Hoboken for 20 years. I'd been there, for, I was there for 10 years before I left. He was there for 20 years, and he was the one who had heard uh, that Hoboken was, among Hobokenites, was known as the City of Grudges. So I love that, and that went into the title. Um, I'm going to read one Hoboken poem tonight and move on to other things, but um, when I've gone back to Hoboken, it has drastically changed, like so many places. But I, I kind of miss it, although it had a lot of problems at that point, so... It's good that some things have gotten better. Let me start <coughs> back in Connecticut when I was a wee one. Uh, and this is a poem called Saying Cheese, 1960. I should say, because I'm old and you may not be, that the, a brownie is a type of camera. Saying Cheese, <coughs> 1960. Posed for the brownie. Tyrolean shorts and dimpled knees, red sneakers, corn silk hair, thumb held ready for sucking after the shot. Behind me, scene of my crimes, 
our brick apartment with its struggling hedge. Launched my water rocket into the eye of a crow. Painted a kiss on the Doberman with my mother's lipstick. Bounced my Super Bowl so high it scared an airplane. Punished. Hid inside my wooden toy chest and plotted revenge with my rubber sword and cellophane x-ray glasses. Who said my life was green Kool-Aid and goodnight kisses? They didn't know. My teeth were wiggling loose. My chemistry set had poisoned the laundry. My turtles were swimming up from the toilet bowl. My mother was saving her temper for after the last shot. <laughs> I was prompted to write that after finding those photographs uh, in family albums. We'll jump ahead a little bit. I'm physically older, not necessarily older in maturity. Young man in Manhattan in the early 1980s, and that's when this poem is set. Uh, the Brock Band is the Clash, which once upon a time were now the new thing, and now they're probably classic rock and roll. This is back when they were the new thing. The night I saw The Clash, Back from my first business trip, three weeks studying paper mill chemistry in Appleton, Wisconsin, where placemats read, 12 steps to making cheese. And the diner cowboy, nursing coffee in a camel, greeted me each morning. Hey, Manhattan, bet you've never seen a tornado. No, but bored silly by my best western suite, I'd ridden the mechanical bull in a stripper bar. Dancers wore striped thongs and pasty stars adding up to flags. The waitress called me hun. Back in Times Square, my suits dropped at the cleaners, a quarter gram in my pocket, meeting my girlfriend for the new Vim vendors. When a teenage new waver in pressed cuff jeans hawked me two tickets to the clash at Bonds. Christ. The clash had owned my brain for months. London calling to the faraway towns. Now war is declared, battle come down. London calling to the underworld. Come out of the cupboard, you boys and girls. Already, I could hear the mighty bass goose stomping across stage. The singer belting out anarchy under concert lights landing like UFOs. Fuck them vendors. I had to rescue my girlfriend from the cinema now. My life in paper chemistry was over. I hustled up Broadway and nearly collided with two street urchins chased by a lumbering wino. Baggy crotch, piss stained the size of a continent, bandaged hand, wagging a shiny knife. His chimney soot hair and scabby red face made him a drunken devil to these boys who'd slashed his pockets for loose coins and now ran for their lives, thrilled to cheat death. But he smiled at me with gold in his teeth, Odysseus disguised, the warrior who'd crossed the mocking plains and returned to test citizens to see beneath his filth. I vowed, my God, don't ever let me leave this town again. I actually wrote that, uh, again, time flies. Uh, It was Joe Strummer, I believe, passed away, and I heard that on the radio one morning, and I recalled going to that show, and it spurred me to write that uh, poem. It's kind of an homage to him and the band. Jump ahead, 1996. I've been living on... East 47th Street in Midtown Manhattan with, um, you know, bricks. 10.30 at night, the garbage truck would come through and they'd start compacting. We were on the fifth floor. That echoing up was so loud. If you were on the phone, you had to hang up the phone because you couldn't talk over it. So, you know, the high life of Manhattan. Left that for a log cabin in in the middle of the woods out in Phoenicia. Uh, Complete change. That's where I had the wood stove and the mice. Uh, pretty active mice too. <laughs> I remember coming home one night and 
it was cold out and I, I, I turn on the, I, before I even turn on, I think I turn on the light and there's one right on the, on the pantry shelf just staring at me, Google-eyed, like, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> so, moving into my cabin, that's what this poem is. It's kind of an, a, a recollection of that experience, that great change in my life. Moving into my cabin, hung a Cherokee bear mask by the door, loaded the pencil holder with wild turkey feathers, gathered an armload of dead branches for the kindling box, picked asters and goldenrod for the old pickling jar on the table, decorated the windowsill with birch bark and bird nests, a littered shotgun shell for a humorous touch, swept mouse droppings off the shelves, shook dust from the fireplace rug, noticed again the smell of the cabin, 30-year-old logs varnished whiskey brown, charred chimney stones, wool blankets passed from owner to owner, brewed pine needle tea, wiped owl pellets from the porch bench, transcribed in my journal the song of the stream, listened to the red-eyed vireo owning the treetop till sunset, lingered over sautéed mushrooms and stew, studied moths on the windows, dozens, hundreds, fluttering, crawling, staring with eyes tinier than crumbs, yet gold, gold as fire, stepped outside to join moths at the windows, my first friends. Oh, whoops, is that really tea, pine needle tea? Yes, white pine. You just get pine needles and throw it in some hot water. White pines, yeah. It has, um, I believe, the sailors in the er colonial or earlier days. They would, they, uh, they'd suffered. I believe it was from scurvy, and they found that drinking pine needle tea was a source, I believe, of vitamin C. So it was very medicinal for them. Can't say it tastes good, but <laughs> it can be done. <laughs> So this is a, this is a Hoboken poem. I threw, have one of these for you. This and again, it's love in the city of grudges. Uh, Sunday afternoon, the river smelled like engines. I slipped through the pier fence, hidden behind the green copper terminal where commuter trains sat vacant on Sundays. Temping all week, I had no other time to plan out my novel, Hoboken Rising. For inspiration, I brought my cache of dollar paperbacks from Hoboken Vintage Comics, where someone had unloaded college staples, Sartre, Celine, Brecht, Gravity's Rainbow, classics I'd skipped, too busy majoring in misery over girlfriends. Finally serious about literature, I, pulled old, I piled old dock ropes into a chair and held pages firm against wind that tossed gulls on wingtips dipped in black ink. I read the first line, but not for the first time. A screaming comes across the sky. What was it about Pynchon's masterpiece? All summer, I couldn't get past his octopus with Pavlovian training. My, ap my attention drifted to washed up buoys trapped in pure piling eddies. Then the green Fuji blimp nosing overhead, a sky whale bound for Newark. I stood up and waved like an airport runway jockey, pretending to redirect the beast to Bayonne. My wife asked why I didn't read fun books instead. Let's go together, I replied. I'll read Keats to your nipples. But Sunday afternoons, she volunteered at the church shelter, baking lasagna for 40. Literature's no substitute for helping others, she told me. But she hadn't read what I'd write. Sunday afternoons, the river smelled like engines was my first line. The rest could be anything. So now I want to change direction a little bit. Um, years ago, I got obsessed with the movie Night of the Living Dead, which I see one person nodding. 
I don't see anyone cringing, but you could cringe too. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it was, came out in 1968. It really kind of launched uh, the zombie craze that we've had for a generation now. I once read an interesting article that kind of compared uh, that movie to the Sex Pistols. The Sex Pistols brought us punk rock in 1976, and they were this crazy, obscure band that self-destructed and didn't last very long. But punk music kind of grew and grew and grew and grew to be a very major mainstream thing. Kind of the same with this movie. It was like the first very low-budget zombie movie, and over time, zombie movies grew and grew and grew until they're now a major, uh, became a major phenomenon with a TV series and all of that. Um, I have kind of reasons to explain why I got obsessed with this, this movie. My mother had been in a nursing home for a long time and she was very incapacitated and a lot of people in nursing homes can be that way. And I just think there's some other reasons why when I saw that movie it was more than entertaining. It really somehow spoke to me about life. Um, so I'm now going to finish by reading a series of poems that were inspired by that particular movie. Um, there are some gory moments in that movie, although compared to today, <laughs> not so, but at the time, very shocking. Um, so there's a little bit of that in the poems, but I hope not too much. Um, and in a funny way, you know, it's interesting. I, I feel some sympathy for the zombies, as, as deadly as they are. I, I, so I'm trying to kind of walk the line between being scared to death of them and also trying in a way to appreciate what they represent. Um, and I'm also, I don't, I'm still fascinated as to what it, is, what it is about zombies that captivates us and scares us and makes us so interested in them. Uh, it's a question I really haven't answered. The, you know, the living dead walking among us trying to eat us. Where does that come from? So here we go. The first one is called Why I Love Zombies. And I use the heart symbol. Why I Love Zombies. They've let go of their pride. They're not vampire aristocrats spoiled by virginal necks or mummies older than Christ. They're retired plumbers in boxer shorts pulled snug on beer and potato chip bellies or housewives in dumpy nightgowns wandering barefoot on the lawn hypnotized by crickets. They're not Frankenstein's monster with bolts in his neck or alien cone heads with 500 IQs and rotten claw teeth. They're volunteer firemen with charcoal puffy eyes from watching Carson night after night or secretaries softening faces with cold cream before bed. They're not bikers, hippies, or rednecks, the stock villains of 1968, but young men with good haircuts and worthwhile careers, teaching high school biology or managing a Chevrolet showroom. All good citizens, they're eager to help a young crew from Pittsburgh film a low-budget nightmare at an old farmhouse. Amid spotlights slashing the lawn, they shuffle and groan as cameramen kneel for close-ups, gunshots to the chest, spikes to the head. They're thrown out and burned like junk furniture. They have no idea. One day they'll be famous, terrifying us by being so ordinary. I, I kind of, you know, I invite the zombies into my own family home. So this is one of those poems. I really do kind of mingle that movie with my own memories. The Zombie Gene. I see it in the way my brother drives 45 on the highway, a company messenger despite his master's degree. Entering rooms, he no longer turns on the lights, but sits in the dusk furrowing his brow. The winter our mother died, he walked at the beach and pronounced himself cured. I wish I could drive a tire iron through his forehead, puncture his lethargy, release his ambition. Instead, he still lives with dad and nags him over TV dinners to take blood pressure pills. Late night in the den, where we first watched Night of the Living Dead, they now revere Charlie Rose interviews. 
they don't understand. In their backyard, deafening crickets mask the slobbering chewing of a zombie, still wearing her old wedding, her old tennis dress for gardening. I feed her my heart, she never stops eating. A daughter of zombies. Let's start with the bark-faced woman hugging the matching bark of a tree to devour a beetle with an appetite verging on lechery. Did her daughter grow up to be a serial killer, cannibal, pet torturer, guest sicko on Springer at least? Or did she become ordinary, a manicurist, bank teller, or better, a hospital nurse in rural Pennsylvania where you think nothing ever goes wrong, but does, with chainsaws, ladders, deer rifles, and of course, alcohol men in vehicles. Sure, she's seen miracles, fingers sewn on, hearts shocked back to beating, but never the dead reawakening, not like her mother in bark makeup. No, the dead simply looked a size or two smaller after losing all prospect of moving. After work, she volunteers at the church pantry, visits old family friends in nursing homes, sticks to Weight Watchers, and keeps all regrets about not marrying to herself. For videos, she prefers romantic comedies and anything with Steve Martin, but every so often rents Night of the Living Dead to watch her mother. Yes, her mother, the school librarian who insisted on Sunday dinner with linen napkins and grace, plunges to her knees to savor that beetle. Her bark face twists beyond pain into ecstasy. What did the director say to give her mother such freedom? The nude model with a mortuary tag on her wrist. A little side anecdote, I, when I got, got obsessed with the movie, I got the DVD edition, which has all of the backstory and the making of the film. And it, it fascinated me how the cast was so interested in the nude model in the movie. You watch the movie, you get like a half a second of her, but they kept going on and on about her. And then you saw the posters that were used to sell the movie. <laughs> the nude model is in the posters. They kind of cropped it a little bit, but um, you know, I guess it was initially released as a drive-in movie, so this was not high art <laughs> when, it, when it hit the world. It became high art. It didn't start there. So this is called The Nude Model with a Mortuary Tag on Her Wrist. How far did you walk from your cold table on wheels, Smythe, Carol, 40916? How many pasture fences did you cross without scratches? Road puddles without muddying toes. Arriving late at the lawn party, you mingle among wives in sack dresses who envy your marble white poses. All the good husbands ignore how moonlight sculpts your buttocks and casts a tail down your spine. The forlorn painter who loved you without a word shuffles under a spruce, his cheeks peeling like paper mache. He never mastered the flesh you modeled with such ease. For hours, you were his Venus, until you asked, so politely, if you might pee. Is it tragic you died so young? Or do we prefer you this way? Breasts firm as refrigerated dough. Do polished shins smelling of hay. All we know. You left before the party spilled into the house. Nor in the morning did the posse, sweeping fields, drop you with a marksman's shot. Are you still walking, luring farm boys down from their silos to consummate in hay? Are you releasing doves from their rib cages, leading you home to the sea? That, of course, is the myth of Venus, 
in that movie, they um, they shot the movie, they shot the movie, and then they later decided they needed to add an explanation into the movie of what what was going on, and so they added this element of um, a news report from Washington D.C. And George Romero and others went down to Washington D.C. to film this, and it, it's presented in the movie as though it's a newscast. And the source of zombies in the movie is that a satellite has returned from Venus with an extraordinary high level of radiation, I guess burned up or crashed. And the suggestion is that high radiation from Venus, the goddess of love, is the cause of, these, of this outbreak of zombieism. So that, that gave me the idea for that poem. This one is called The Ritchie Brothers. Rudy and Ritchie still so handsome after driving drunk through the railing, shambling and late to the party with killer black lashes and cavernous eyes, bruised lips, half button shirts and cologne like formaldehyde. The women adore you, yet sense a great change. No more necking in doorways or trophy bras slung over doorknobs. Not even the not even the nude model with marble white skin catches your eyes. What happened? No swigging back pocket pints, no fire in your breath, no lust in your hands. You wait patiently in line with zombies to scavenge from the farm truck's burnt cab. Then kneel with hunger you didn't know you had to grab squirmy intestines spilled on the grass. The long tube you chew towards the middle brings you to a last bite shared like a kiss. Rudy and Richie in love at last. One of the striking characters in the movie is a girl and um, child star. She's the one in the basement. If you've seen the movie, you'll know who she is. Child star. Bitten by a zombie, the nine-year-old girl lay feverish under blankets. Only one line to remember, and she didn't forget. I hurt. Pale and solitary, she never fidgeted or needed to pee. On a basement table, she lay at peace with her parents bickering. Her bull-headed father triumphed down the stairs to throw his crushed cigarette pack and announce, We'll see when they come begging me. Her dark-haired mother with beauty queen lips sneered. We may not enjoy living together, but dying together isn't going to solve anything. Long bathed in strife, the girl ignored them, yet noticed all the adults working on set smoked, and a year later started herself, luckies, then parliaments. She didn't think much of her performance, but who can forget her? She rose at the end in her Sunday dress to two-hand a trowel over her head, revealing the slip at her knees, then dug deep into her mother's chest to find the love that she wanted. <laughs> in black and white, blood splattered the walls as if she'd struck oil. I'm glad to hear some laughter after a poem like that. <laughs> this one is called Respect. Um, I'm not a movie person, but uh, in, in that DVD where they were all talking about everything, they, they described this particular scene as what they call a jump shot. Jump meaning it's supposed to make the audience jump out of their chair. And this, this one worked. Uh, the main character is walking by a window. It's fairly early, early in the movie. They boarded up all the windows for protection. They're secure. One of them is walking by a boarded up window, and suddenly through the window comes his hand. And it leads to a very scary kind of situation. I decided to write that scene, not from the point of view of the guy inside trying to stop the zombie, but from the point of view of the guy reaching in the hand. You know, why is he doing that? What is he trying to do? He's reaching into the light, you might say. So it's called respect. To reach through boarded up window slots 
into the scared light of men with hammer and rifle. To want nothing more than to touch human warmth, even as they sever your fingers. To grab hold of the barrel as the bond between you and pull with all the love you can muster. To accept the shot to your chest, the stain blossoming on your white shirt. To bow with respect. To raise your head slowly in shadows that make caves of your eyes. To let darkness stanch your wounds. To step forward softly, not to disturb worms. To approach the window accepting the sad truth. Their terrible fear is the burden that allows grace. To say nothing, no matter how brutal the shooting, how many fingers you leave on the floor. To be on the lawn, to lie on the lawn after the third shot opens your third eye. To stare at the stars, which have seen this before and will see it again. Now the guy, as I investigated this, the guy that I took an interest in as the screenwriter, um, I guess because I'm a writer myself, I'm not a screenwriter, but I'm a writer myself. You know, I guess in the world of movies, the screenwriter is always the bottom figure on the totem pole. <laughs> and so this is um, a poem kind of in honor of the screenwriter of The Night of the Living Dead. He, he talked his way into a cameo appearance. He got to be a zombie, and so that's what this poem is about, his, his brief moment of fame. The Screenwriter's Cameo. At 4 a.m., he sidles in the mudroom door, tattered sleeve hanging from his uplifted arm. The spotlight casts a corona on her blonde hair, his heroine in an easy chair, far more angelic than he dared put into words. Under hot lights, her perfume smells of roses. He acts his best, despite his gimpy leg dragging a fold in the rug his left hand clutching his waist as if stabbing pains are trying to reel him back out the door by a fish hook. He has so much to confess, if only she'd notice. He wrote his dreams into her role, not just the blonde hair, but her loyalty and church going, the way she stopped to listen to a music box. He's not the lurid hack she might think. Half the stories about bar girls and trailer parks aren't even true. He'd introduce himself properly, but his dry throat rasps, strip mined by cigarettes and laryngitis. He's worked so hard on this movie. Two titles rejected, drastic rewrites on set, his old Steel Town buddies recruited for extras. Earlier tonight, he made crew sandwiches for 20. No task too small, a pickle and potato chips on every plate. Asking for a cameo after the professionals left for bed, he thought he only wanted a minute of fame. But now, lurches forward, so desperate and lovesick, he frightens himself with his talent for ruin. He knows his bad Dracula makeup drips black lipstick down his shirt chin. He knows. He wrote this movie. She'll only glance once, then run out on his pathetic entreaties. The hero will tackle him to the rug, hammer a tire iron into his melon-soft head. Yet his good hand reaches from his tattered sleeve, as if he can touch the woman who wants him to write from his heart instead of his greed. Let me finish with one final poem. I mentioned that um, a source of all this, of my fascination, may well have been the fact that my mother was in a nursing home for 10 years, very incapacitated by strokes. Um, so this, um, you know, it's, 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 her, it's her poem, and it's called Mother Reanimated. To walk again after 10 years in a wheelchair with stirrups that secured her limp feet. To pee, not in her diaper, but in toilets of her own choosing. To spit out her straw 
and eat with her hands, to tell the horse crone in the next bed to shut up, to frighten nurses out in the hallway with her new powers, to press the down button for the first time in years, to knock over plastic flowers in the lobby where automatic doors release her stiff-legged and determined into sunshine. The bronze lawn saint, blessing his circle of mulch, ignores her. Traffic horns blare as she lurches past bumpers, a mad woman in a blue bathrobe and sheepskin slippers, deaf to all but the crows. There's a diner parking lot to cross, a marsh creek with a half-sunken shopping cart to avoid, then railroad tracks smelling of creosote ties that lead her past a brick factory redone as condos. In her day, the factory made Electrolux vacuums. She gravel slides down the track embankment toward the country club tennis courts where she won trophies in singles and doubles despite early arthritis in her hips. She skirts the golf course she detested for its manicured lawn. She saw no need for poisoning dandelions. Sniffed and trailed by a pedigree collie, she blunders through hedges into rose gardens, fragrant but overly trimmed. The fad for koi fish ponds she doesn't understand. Rounding our garage, she reaches her bushy tomatoes at last. Healthy, but poorly staked, marionette plants needing more twine. In the kitchen drawer, the same as she left it, she finds string, clippers, and gloves, then lays the work gloves aside. To feel dirt under her nails is all she wanted from heaven. Thank you. zombie poems, but um, did start making another zine, so yeah, I can do a couple from then. All right. I needed a prompt, um, and I was at my friend's house, and because uh, I was stuck, I don't know what, you know, and um, I was talking to her, her boyfriend, and it's big into Marvel stuff, Marvel Comics and stuff, so um, she grabbed something from her counter and she just threw it at me, and uh, what she threw at me was, um, was some food, and these, it, was, it was Black Mission Figs from California, so I had to make a, I just made a poem about Black Mission Figs. Um, black Mission Figs are grown with pride, my green-blooded, pointy-eared friend. Golden are the gates to the city, or the entrance with heavenly wanderers that even you would find fascinating. In this state of mind over matter, a fact assumption, that do not need or rely on truth, justice, and the American way, who, by the way, was an alien sent by loving parents to escape the doomed planet by the zealot thirst and quest for core resources that are and were not renewable. Black mission figs are grown with pride. So celebrate the pride of growing confidence and consciousness of a new understanding that black mission figs taste damn good. <laughs> do, they, do they taste damn good? Oh, they taste damn good. They taste damn good. They really, well, after writing the poem, they really tasted damn good. Yeah. Um, so I had to work as a ranger um, at the, I was shift, God, where, you know, since this COVID thing, um, I started off the walkway, then it was moved to Mills Mansion, and they ended up at Lake Deconic. Um, so there was plenty of uh, enforcing of you know, social distancing and so on and so forth. But at the end, um, this was the first poem I wrote in a while, and it was the last night 
for all the lifeguards and then the, the, the manager. Um, so it was Labor Day, and um, and they did, they rented a spot um, for you know campsite and then just made a fire. So everyone else was you know partaking in uh, celebrations. I don't do that anymore. So so they asked me what I was doing. I said, I'm writing I'm writing something. So I was under under the gun. So I had to write a poem. So this was Labor Day night. The fire that iron and gold needs is like the Milky Way stars shimmering above a campfire's crackle, chorused by conversations and songs warmed by a red, orange, yellow gold glow. A season's end, a gathering reflecting on the trails, trials, tribulations, and soon-to-be adventures. The story is an old one revised, Retold like the cricket, the crickets zip zip, wolves howl. As it was for ancestors, circled in caves, open fields, and forest clearings. A sharing of our joys, pains, wonder, and creative fascinations. A union that builds a bridge towards a new tomorrow. A future carried by voice and thought. Labor Day night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.